one. Welcome, welcome. You listen to 360 Info. I'm your host, Hamptonio. To manipulate consciousness is to manipulate history. To manipulate history is to manipulate power. And to manipulate power is to manipulate possibilities. Welcome, welcome to the show. I'm back, guys. Great to be back with you guys. Got a great show for you today. Look like a little sun is shining out there. It's about 40 something degrees or whatever. We getting there, Cleveland. We up here in Cleveland. We trying, we trying to hang in there, you know. But hang on in there. You know, sprinter, as they say, is amongst us. And uh, hopefully we'll get some good weather coming in soon. But when I came back here and uh, you know, I had to bring you guys a great show. I had to reach out to one of my my brother's from another month, <laughs> I call it, because uh, he's from Liberia. And, you know, I used to be involved into the Liberian Association. Actually, I'm the first African-American and possibly the only African-American here in Cleveland that was vice president of the Liberian Association here in Cleveland. And, of course, you know, my former wife was from Liberia. And uh, I, I had a chance to tap her brain and to a lot of the culture and, and things that was going on you know, over in Africa, you know, which intrigued me is very, very much. So um, we pleasure, you know, to bring you guys a great, great, great show today. But in a remote studio, we got my good brother, Brother Vince. What's going on? Well, there's a lot going on this weekend. As a matter of fact, tomorrow at Tri-C Eastern's Mandel campus, there's going to be a premiere of a film called The Emancipation of Miss Millie. It's not too late for you to get involved. You can still get tickets and attend this red carpet event. There's going to be the screening, and then I'll be hosting a Q&A with the cast and crew and also uh, recording some interviews with those of you who saw the film and want to share your thoughts. So um, I'm going to put a link up on the 360 Info Network Facebook page so you will have an awareness of what's going on and how you can get involved. So that's coming up tomorrow. Uh, and we will keep you up to date on some other developments as they roll out. So again, welcome to 360 Info Network. Glad to have you. And we have a very special guest with us today. He is Sekou Kella. He's a Liberian citizen, a Pan-African and culture activist. He's the president and the chief executive officer of I Care Canada, which is a non-governmental organization for cultural meditation, mediation, and social empowerment. He has several years of experience in humanitarian and community-based organization works. In 2017, he served as culture mediator for the Italian Red Cross in Catania City. His ability to speak several languages, including Mandingo, Hausa, English, French, and Italian, was highly helpful in making communication simple between migrants and service providers at emergency centers in Sicily. In 2016, he was elected first secretary general of the Federation of Liberation, or I'm sorry, Liberian Mandingo in Europe, a community and culture based organization. Since 2021, he serves as the election committee chair for the Association of Liberian Immigrants in Kitchener and environs alike in Canada. So it is with great pleasure that we welcome to our airwaves and to the program once again, Brother Sekou Keller, my brother, how are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me on 360. I'm <laughs> very happy to be here. I think this is my second time being mm -hmm. here. I'm always in touch with my brother, Antonio. Even when he texts and I don't reply, he keep, he keep <laughs> checking on me. So I'm very grateful, you know, that I'm always here. And yeah. thank you, brother, Mr. Vincent Robinson, for uh, actually inviting me. And I'm very happy to be here. Yes, well, we are certainly glad to have you. And we're anxious to have this conversation because today we're going to talk about Africa. But the mm -hmm. evidence of the relationship between you and my brother Hamptonio, it's, it's the evidence that we are one people. There's no separation between us simply because one might be claiming origin from the other side of the world. And one might say I was born here, but we're all Africans and we need to have this very vital conversation. So once again, welcome mm -hmm. to 360 Info Network. Antonio? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well said, brother. Rich. Well said. Absolutely. And, you know, we want our listeners to play real close attention to, to our good brother here. And, uh, you know, he has a, a serious uh, connection, you know, to what's going on over in the motherland. And, and it's something we have, you know, continually to talk about here on the show about What's going on over in Africa? There were some groundbreaking things, with some historical things 
that are going on over in Africa that we have to be paying attention. It's going to affect you one way or another. It's, it, it, it's just a matter if it's going to affect you blindly or it's going to affect you with your eyes open. That's the question. So we're trying to open up your eyes and, and so you can prepare yourself for what's going on. And when you see things coming down in the national news, that you will understand what was going, what's going on and what is taking place so you can make the proper moves because Africa is the future. There's no doubt about it. Africa is the future. And it's, Africa has been pivotal for a long time in history because our European uh, brothers and sisters, you know, they've been trying to control uh, the south of the equator for a long time. It's, it's Their survival depends on controlling the, the, all the properties in the countries south of the equator because it helps them to sustain themselves. You must understand that. And people would look at Africa and these these southern equator uh, places and countries and wonder why they are not able to, to stand on their own two feet. That's purposeful. You have to understand that because the survival of the north depends on that. And so there's some historic things that are going on in Africa that we have to be paying attention to. And that's why we reached out to our brother, uh, Seku, uh, to, to kind of give us an update on what's going on over there on the continent. My good brother, <laughs> could you tell you just some recent developments that happened in Senegal that kind of uh, 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 sets up, you know, the future or what's going to take place, which I was, you know, predicting through research and listening to what's going on about what may catch on as wildfire that might take place in the whole continent of Africa to change the whole dynamics on what's going on. Could you let us know what's going on, brother? Yes. Uh, thank you once again, you know, for inviting me. Uh, what has been happening in the last few years in Africa, we will call it a revolution or the reawakening of Pan-Africanism in Africa again. So let's go back, let's say three months. You heard about the military coup that happened in the Sahel region in West Africa, where three countries, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, where they toppled the government, they removed the civilian government and they replaced them with military general. And the reason given was that these leaders were uh, colluding with the Western leaders to steal the natural resources. And these Islamist jihadists who were coming from North Africa attacking these countries because Sahel countries are very close to the Sahara Desert. So they share border with North African countries. So they are always attacked by Islamist jihadists. So these military generals found out that their leaders were complicit in sponsoring some of these groups. And they were also responsible in impoverishing their countries and they were in some type of agreement with Western leaders to steal the natural resources. So they replaced them. So while we were discussing these three military generals, there's something interesting happened in Senegal well, about a few weeks ago. So there was a general election, a presidential election. So a Pan-African party, which is a grassroots party, which was founded by a brother called Usman Sonko, they came with the agenda to bring back Pan-Africanism into the country to integrate Africans, to make trade and agreement that favor black people and actually boost their economy. And they said their leaders are, are sellouts. They sell out to the French and the French have been controlling their economy. They wrote books and exposed all the, um, all the kind of a concession agreement and dubious agreements that their government went into. And surprisingly, they got elected. And they got elected by the people the president of Senegal today is 44 years old, and the prime minister is also in his 40. And this brings good news to the Pan-African war, that why we thought that Pan-Africanism is over, uh, is an old idea, as some of the critics have said. Today, we have a Pan-African elected government in Senegal, and that's what we are here to discuss. Mm, right on. Yeah. And that, you know that, that the question that I guess we would want to know and ask ourselves, does that set the tone and set the stage for what's to come in the future? You know, because people have to recognize and understand how young the population is in Africa. You know, yes. the youngest population on the planet. 
where our European brothers and sisters across the planet, they have a diminishing population, you know, around the way. And this is, and people don't understand, this is why uh, uh, this country is up in arms and trying to, you know, turn things backwards at this point. I, I got to put in this quote real quick, what Dr. Whitaker said. Democracy works with a, with a, with a country that a group of people who's in the majority. It don't work. When you uh, your sound, I don't know if it's from my end. But majority. So this is why they may be looking at Donald Trump because. Okay, yeah. are we back? <laughs> Yeah, your son was a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything just went out over there. But I tell you, you said we was in retrograde, didn't you say, Brother Vince? I did. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, uh, could, but, if you could reiterate the quote from Doctor Whitaker. Yes. Okay. 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 That's, okay. All right. Yeah, he he was saying basically that uh, a democracy works when you are a majority. You know, when you when you're in a majority position. It don't work when you're in a minority position. So right. uh, in this country, our European brothers and sisters understand that within a short period of time, they're going to be in a minority. So democracy does not work. This is why they're even entertaining a person like Donald Trump, because he's talking about dictatorship. So it will still give them power in a minority position. So this is something that we we need to understand going going forward as well. So, brother Seku, do you feel that with this new election in in for in Senegal, is it going to set the stage for what's coming forward? Yes, it's it's going to set the stage. I I will share my screen very soon and give you an understanding, a background understanding of how these young men got elected. You know, they were elected with a slogan called La Rupture in French, La Rupture, mean the rupture, the breakaway. We have to break away. So mm. why did they use the term breakaway? So African countries are independent, quote unquote, on independent on paper. But in reality, what has happened is that these countries are not sovereign because it's one thing to be independent with a flag and then have a national anthem and a president. And it's another thing to have what we call sovereignty. Sovereignty is what distinguishes poor countries from so-called industrial countries. Because people don't understand. They think poor countries are just poor because the people are lazy. No, it's because they are not sovereign. Their economy doesn't belong to them. Yes. But you don't see it. The they, the leadership is manipulated, and the military is not is not as strong and powerful enough to control protect the border. The currency and the economy is run by outside forces. So you have these, a lot of these countries in Africa are like that. So they have the natural resources, the wealth is there, but there is a geopolitics in place that makes sure that they do not have sovereignty. And as long as you do not have sovereignty, there is no way you can talk of prosperity. There's no way you can talk of development because you are still under somebody. It's like you live in somebody's basement and you're trying to be a landlord in the person's basement. No, you just have to come out of that basement. So that's what these young men are saying, break away. They say, now it's over. The old guard, the politics you've been playing with France, we need to cut it off. We don't want that anymore. We don't want that type of politics. We want the politics of equality, of equity. We want equal, what is used in French, gagnant, gagnant, win-win situation. We have to debate with the French as equals, not as their former colonies. We have to debate with them as equals so that we they win and we win. So it's not that like they come to uh, Dakar and tell us what we need to do. That's where they are going to be different than the old guards. Brother Sekou, I have to ask this question uh, as you brought up the idea of economics and the impact of colonialism on the economies of African countries. And right now we're seeing groups like the World Economic Forum and other think tanks impose their idea of what should happen with money because of the fact that the US dollar is rapidly losing value and you've got organizations like the BRICS that are forming and pushing away from American hegemony when it comes to economics. 
Uh, one of the things that has happened historically is that African countries have had to accept deals from the, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And so they're still beholden to those banking institutions, even though they want to separate themselves from the impact of, of colonialism. Uh, what do you see as the impact of the BRICS on the economies of the countries of Africa? Uh, I think I heard recently that Zimbabwe is moving towards a gold standard. What do you see happening in terms of economics in these countries that are pulling away from colonial rule? Right. It's, um, it's a bit of a challenge because the, after World War II, the Europeans set uh, an order, a system that play within that, 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 that play to their rule the World Bank, the IMF, an entire economic, global economic system was designed to, to be in their favor. So what happened is if you try to do something different, then what they do then is to cripple your economy. So they set that with the US dollars, they set that with a lot of trade agreements, and they make sure that that's how it works. So what people have found out recently is that, look, these people, apart from the, yes, they have industries, but they don't have the natural resources. They don't have some of this wealth, the real wealth, we have it. So we need to redefine the rule. This is where the battle starts. So the BRICS movement, which consists of uh, China, Brazil, South Africa, and India, they have uh, emerging economy. I've decided to create a system that is going to rival this uh, monetary system that has been created by the West. So many countries are trying to join. So Zimbabwe, for example, they says Robert Mugabe drove out the white farmers who were actually a colonial remnant of people who grabbed the land from the people of Zimbabwe. They were a minority, but then they own 90% of the land and they were doing everything. So Robert Mugabe told them, if you can uh, share the land equally back with our people, then I will take everything from you. So Robert Mugabe seized the land from them. So the entire Western world went after Zimbabwe and crippled the economy. Zimbabwe was actually the food basket of Africa. The, it was really a, a, an emerging economy, a powerful country, but they crippled it down to zero. So now what the current Zimbabwe government have done is to create a currency that is being backed by gold. That the currency is now being, but the value of the currency is being backed by gold. Now, whether that is going to work, some say it's an old method that was used uh, in the, and it, it can only work if your surrounding countries try to do the same and support you. Like if all African countries, for example, try to do the same, then it will become very, very uh, uh, significant. But if only one country does it, then it's very easy for them to still manipulate and destroy the economy. So what we have today, the, 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 the struggle in the world is, um, global economy have to be redefined because we are moving into a multipolar world where there is no one superpower in the country. I mean, in the world, you have more than one or two, three superpowers. So now everybody can decide to be able to create your own alliance. You don't have to create alliance with USA or the Europe of Europe by force. You can create alliance with China. You can create alliance with Russia. You can create alliance with anybody to be able to, to support yourself until you can build your own economy. So African countries, a few of them are waking up to the reality that there is no uh, developed country and developing country is a myth. The idea that the European created, they said there's a first world country, there's a second world country and third world country. So this mm -hmm. idea was created after the Cold War to show that the Western world are the industrial economy, they are the first world. So people must follow their model, people must follow them if you want to develop you have to follow them. Then the second world is the USSR and Russia and other people. So they are industrialized, but they don't have democracy. They don't follow all these rules. So therefore they can never be as powerful as the West. Then the third world countries are countries that were formerly colonized. And these countries have no future, except they decide to ally themselves with the first world country. Right. But what the Africans think as I find out is that there is no such thing as first world, second world, and third world country. What we have is sovereign countries who are powerful enough 
to destabilize other countries that are not that don't have sovereignty and take their economy, destabilize their economy. That's all. If you are able to have sovereignty, you can be as powerful as any other country. Ivory Coast alone produced the it's the world larger producer of cocoa. If you eat chocolate anywhere in the world, you are likely getting it from Ivory Coast. But Ivory Coast does not produce chocolate. But they have to give the cocoa bean to France. Nigeria produces oil and gas, but all the refineries in Nigeria are broken down. They have to refine the oil outside Nigeria and bring it back and sell it to their people high price. Mm -hmm. South Africa signed agreement, an industrial power like South Africa signed agreement that they are not going to manufacture. The World Bank and other uh, uh, partners make them sign agreement that they are not going to manufacture cars. They only going to assemble, so that the manufacturing has to happen outside, and then it has to be assembled in their country. Now, why would I sign an agreement that prevents me from manufacturing? If you do that, they help your economy. If you refuse, then they try to to, to destroy your economy. So mm -hmm. these are some dubious agreement behind mm -hmm. door that people don't see. They actually tell you you got to produce cocoa and coffee, but don't produce chocolate. Then your economy will be fine. If you say, no, I need industry to produce the coffee, then they find a way to boycott you and destroy your economy. Mm -hmm. So it's against terrorism going on in the economy sector that, that people need to know. Mm -hmm. So these countries in Africa are saying, you know what, guys? Mm -hmm. Let's put our acts together. We need these industries. We need this sovereignty to produce our own economy. These mm -hmm. guys cannot continue to sell this idea that if we don't ally with them, we can survive. Our ancestors survived without even knowing they existed. Right, you're right. I, I agree. Agree with that, and that's and, and and that's one of the things we have to recognize. You know, you you, you plainly stated that, brother Seku, is that you know, and this is I think really the formation of BRICS. You know, America's been taking a dollar and a muscle and carrying it around the planet, and if you don't do what we tell you to do, then we're gonna put sanctions on you. You see, and folks are tired of that. I mean, we, we can just look at the whole, you know, LGBT type of situation that they're trying to bring forth in Africa. You know, they, you know, a lot of the leaders are saying, hey, it's not our culture. We're not going to discriminate against anybody, but we're not going to set the whole stage up and system up the way you want us to do it. But guess what? OK, they wanted to try to put some sanctions on Ghana and and, and a couple other countries as well, because this is not our culture. They try to impose their way on that. So people are getting tired of that countries are getting tired of that and that and i think what's pivotal right there is understanding and and that's why i think pretty much what you just said brother seku yeah. is why some of these countries are standing up the way they are because they got other avenues other avenues that they can uh ride on and to do they can line up with russia now they can line up with china now and you see a lot of these countries leaders are saying look you can't tell us what to do you know, this is not a culture. We're not going to perform like that, you know, America. And so now, now there's some propaganda is going to take place now. Mm -hmm. Now they, they're in there trying to say China is doing this to y'all. Y'all, you know, now America's trying to work the back door now to, to, to win some kind of favor now as far as Africa. And when, if, if America just would have been right in the beginning, they could have had the whole doggone continent if they had just been fair, went in and split deals. Uh, to where both parties benefit, but we just couldn't do that. Your to thoughts. the point about the uh, gold and the uh, backing of currency with it, uh, we can look back to the assassination of Muammar Gaddafi because mm -hmm. he was moving towards having a gold standard and unifying the entire continent, all of those. He wanted, he wanted an organization of African states to come together and change the currency system. I have to point out that 20% of the oil was was uh, transactions that did not involve the US dollar. So what you're seeing is the Chinese with their Yuan working out deals with the Saudis to purchase that petroleum with something other than the US dollar. So we're definitely seeing a movement away from the weaponization of the US dollar. You may recall that there were sanctions against Russia that resulted in almost half a billion dollars in assets being frozen. Countries around the world are saying, hey, we don't want to be in the same position 
where you use the dollar as a weapon against us. And that's why these alternatives are happening. Uh, I'm just curious about the impact of this paradigm shift with countries that you mentioned, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, and now possibly Senegal, with people moving away from the weaponization of the U.S. dollar and the impact that that has on the economies of those countries. Right. Um, it's it's uh, this new government of Senegal, for example, they campaign to end the CFA, the CFA, which is the uh, a currency designed by France, and the acronym CFA it was again French was actually. They, it was called franc colony. That means the colonial territory currency. So the, this currency is produced in France. They, uh, they, 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 everything about it is controlled by France. And it's have a standard kind of uh, exchange rate with the euro. French pretty much own the money. So they in the, the Senegalese new government saying, look, we need to get we need to get rid of this currency. And go back to what our founding fathers of ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, they have an idea to create a currency called ECO. Mm -hmm. So this ECO currency was supposed to be a currency for all West African countries. They were supposed to use one currency. But now France made sure that this ECO idea does not come to fruition. They frustrated the idea through Ivory Coast because Ivory Coast has a puppet government. So, so the new Senegalese government are saying we have two options. One is either African Nigeria try to take a leadership role and take its responsibility along with Ghana, and we create an eco currency for the entire West Africa, or we are going to ally with these military guys in the Sahel and create a new currency entirely, because the safer currency cannot continue. How can we have a currency? That if it has a name, the acronym of it actually means that we are colony. First of all, people think, I don't know what they think. Dignity is the most important thing in life. Mm -hmm. Dignity. You can take my land and give, I, can, I can get it back from you. You can steal my money and I can get it back from you. But if you take away my dignity, there is no other way for me to get it other than to fight. Because... The dignity is what defines everything. So if you have a country, you are you say you are a sovereign nation, you have a people, what is important is dignity, first of all. So how do you have a currency produced by another country? Will France ever accept for Britain or Russia to produce their and control their currency? They would rather die than see that happen. So why should we accept it? And we have so-called intellectuals in Africa who can actually sit down behind books and say, yeah, it's, it's it's okay, you know. <clears throat> so these young men are saying we have to we have to end that immediately. Mm -hmm. We have to create our own currency. Whether the currency is good or bad, we have to find that out because we shouldn't be afraid of making mistakes. This is one of the problem. And I always gave uh, this uh, story given by Sheikh Antadio. It's an analogy. He gave all any time he gave his speech. He said the, the, the general the intellectual imprisonment of black people in Africa can be likened to a 19th century slave who at midnight was released by his master. The master tell him there is emancipation, emancipation proclamation, you are free, you are supposed to leave now. And this slave goes out of the door at 12 midnight. He gets out and he finds out that there's snow and rain and storm and dogs out there barking. And he said, well, I'm free. The master's free me tonight, but I can't leave. It's snowing out there. There's a lot of rain out there. There are dogs and all type of wild animals attacking me. So I'm going to go back and tell the master, let him give me one more night in his basement. Tomorrow morning when there's sunshine, there's no more rain, and there's no more dogs, then I can go. Then the slaves go back and knock on the door, and the masters open the door and say, what do you want? You are free now. He said, well, there's, a, there's snow out there. It's raining. There's dogs and all type of animals out there. So I want to sleep over. Let me come over and be your slave just for tonight. And tomorrow morning, I can leave and go. And the master said, OK, go to the basement. And he goes to the basement, and the morning never came. 
Every morning he asked the master, is it morning yet? He said, no, it's not morning yet. Stay there. <laughs> that is what has happened to the intellectual imprisonment of black people. We went back to people who colonized and slave us and said, we want you to fix our economy. Are you kidding me? Yes, yeah, yes. Somebody for 500 years who dehumanized you is going to fix your economy? It's now going to be your good partner? It's going to make sure you become a superpower? Are you kidding me? And to have an African country become superpower is to tell the Western world to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. They're not going to do it. So they benefit from you, the poverty of Africa, which is a poverty that was strategically created. So we need to fight. That's why these young men are saying we have to break away. Mm -hmm. It's an intellectual breakaway, cultural breakaway, economic, diplomatic, all breakaway. Mm -hmm. We have to recreate the term that we have with these people. So this is where we are. So I, I would like to share my screen a little bit, just give you a little understanding of what happened in Senegal before we can uh, move on. So you have the two gentlemen on the screen. Uh, oh, I don't know why I have this. Okay. These two gentlemen on the screen, they created a political party called PASTEF. You see on the right, on the left here in green and white. Okay. So the, the acronym is the African Patriot of Senegal for Work, Ethics, and Fraternity. So that's what it means in French, but it is the acronym that is called PASTEF. So these brothers, they, two of them were tax uh, officers. They work in the government to be collecting revenue. So through that, they were able to uncover documents upon documents that actually gave French access to everything in their country. The French were controlling the petroleum and the gas, which uh, Senegal is about to start production. The French were given um, like a monopoly in most of the economic affairs of Senegal. They were allowed to do everything. And these guys find out that there were a lot of dubious concession agreement. So they decided to write a book. They were literally whistleblowers. So they form a Pan-African party to rally around the youth. And guess what? The government did not just sack them from office. They imprisoned them for, for saying the truth. So young people from Sheikh Anta Diop University took the street and said, you must release them. So they became the phase of revolution in Senegal. And they ascribed to Pan-Africanism. And they call all African youth to support their movement. So what happened this uh, this month is that they, they, I mean, let me go back a little bit. Um, so the brother with a hat on the head, who, who has the cap with the, the, the African clothes, the black clothes on, he is called Usman Sonko. He's the founder of the party. He was the presidential candidate. He was more outspoken, very charismatic. So what the French did was to connive with the president and then they created a lot of allegations against him. They said he was corrupting the youth they said he was radical. They put him in prison. So he said, okay, this revolution is not going to be just about me. If they put me in prison, I'm going to look for some of the boys I have trained to also run for office. So he chose a secretary, the guy in white, whose name is Usman, uh, whose name is Jomai Fai, the, bro the brother in white. He was the secretary of the party. He said, you run for president. Send so they put me in prison. The revolution is not about looking for Messiah or Savior. It's about creating an, a consciousness where the people can take their own destiny. They can be able to be in charge of their own destiny. So we are not looking for Messiah. I'm not a Messiah. So my secretary will run for office. Guess what happened? The secretary got elected as president. Here he stands. When he came after the election, he came to take over from the the outgoing president, Maki Saab. So here is the 44-year-old Joma Ifai, secretary to the Pan-African Party, who was 10 days before election, he was also in prison. And there was no sign that he was ever going to win because his boss, the, 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 the actual guy who was supposed to be president, was put in jail as well, and he got elected. So I said there are lessons that we can learn from this uh, election in Senegal. The first lesson is, African youth are asking for change and sovereignty all over because we are tired of 
being portrayed as poor people while we live on the richest land on this planet. We need to change that. If I sleep on gold and diamonds and yet my children cannot have affordable, you can't have hospitals, they can access schools and good health care and good road and clean housing. It means something is wrong with the politics that govern these resources. So that's what the African youth are demanding change. Two, Pan-Africanism remains the greatest political ideology in Africa, whether you like it or not. We've tried the neoliberalism. We've tried all these ideologies coming out of the West. None of them have worked. The ideology that freed the continent from colonialism was Pan-Africanism. And the ideology that will bring Africa back to development is going to be Pan-Africanism. Like it or not, the signs are on the wall. And that's what we have to gravitate towards. Three, democratic revolution is possible without war or military coup. What these guys have demonstrated in Senegal is that we don't need to always take a gun and kill an African president like we did in Liberia in the 80s with Samuel Kayendo, or we did with Talba, like we did in, in, in like they did in other places around Africa. We can mobilize the people and overthrow these rogue regimes in Africa. We, all we need to do is to just uh, uh, create awareness, mobilize the African masses where we can always change these guys because you can never be powerful than the people. And three, and that does not mean that military coup sometimes is not necessary, but it also means that we can use democratic process to always remove this rogue regime from power. And there is no force greater than the people. This is what the Senegal election has really taught us. So this is something you need to know about the geopolitics of West Africa. Mm -hmm. It's called the France Afrique geopolitics. And I gave you an image here to give you an understanding of what the, how the geopolitics works. The chicken or the cock standing here, the fowl, is actually wearing, the, it's a symbol of France. And here's Africa, huge bag of corn lying on the floor being eaten by this corn. Now, it's a parasitic relationship. This parasitic relationship, the Western war is a parasite on Africa. But they always make it as if they are saving Africa. But in reality, their entire food, their survival depend on this continent. This is what people need to know. Africa has one of the larger arable land in the world a land that you can cultivate and produce food to fill the entire planet. Africa have the larger reserve of fresh water. Where fresh water is going to be one of the most expensive thing in the world in a few centuries to come. We have a large deposit. That continent is a natural paradise. We are not saying it. And what we need to do now is to, because there's a lot of focus on the natural resources of the continent. So what we need to do is to focus on the mind of the African come on, come on. to become the most important resources. Mm -hmm. If the mind of the African become the most important commodity we focus on to make it powerful, then these resources will be saved. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this is this parasitic relationship called France-Afrique is what has been going on while France continue to live on Africa's back. Mm -hmm. So Senegal in the 19th system was created to be the intellectual center for France Afrique. That's where they build the UN headquarters, the UNICEF headquarters is. That's where all the major institutions of the Western war in West Africa are in Senegal. That's their intellectual center. Ivory Coast is the economic center for the France Afrique. Then uh, uh, Chad and other places is the military center. So they have an entire structure in place. U.S. has one of its biggest drone base in, 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 uh, between Niger and Chad. They are operating. So this entire region are militarized, economically, politically, they are controlled. But when you are out there in the West, you are like Africans have leaders, they have presidents, why are they not fixing their country? We are under siege. These countries are not free. They appear free to you on TV, but they are not free at all. This is what is going on. So this is why these young men are trying to say, we must break away from this cycle. Now, there's a challenges ahead, great challenges ahead of these young men because 
10 days before election, they got released from prison. The two of them here, Usman and Jomai Fai. Now, Usman is the main guy who was supposed to be president, but they the court barred him from running, so he chose a secretary, and the secretary became president. But people are asking questions, why were they released 10 days before elections? What were the negotiations that took place? Now, we are scared of the Mandela factor. If you know the Mandela factor, if, because we Pan-African, we have to be vigilant. We, 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 we are not moved by emotions. We are moved by facts. We know the Mandela factor, where the man fought for his country. He gave his life. But a few days before his release, they went and negotiated with him to compromise the very revolution that he fought for to leave the land in the hand of the white South African minority, to leave the gold and the diamonds in the hand of the South African minor white minorities, and to leave the wealth that was stolen from South Africa in the hand of the white minority. So Mandela got out, he became president, he became a Jesus-like figure for sacrificing the future of South Africa. Now, this we are afraid that these two brothers, 10 days before they are released, U.S. sent delegations. We saw delegations from ECOWAS because they became the most popular figure in the country. The young men block all the roads and say, you release them or there's no election. So they had no option. And there's rumor that they went to the prison and told them, you, we, we got to negotiate. We don't know what negotiation took place. We don't know. But we believe that these brothers have to stay true to their word because they promised the young people a glorious future. And that future, they must be able to work towards. Because, and the good news is when they took over, they are, about two, they are two weeks now in office. They made some strategic moves that shown that they, 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 they are definitely not on the way to sell, to being sell out. The first thing they did, they changed, the, they, they changed the name of the ministry. There's the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They changed the name to Ministry of African Integration and Foreign Affairs. That's a Pan-African move. They said, we're no longer going to have a Ministry of Foreign Affairs. No African is a foreigner in Africa. So we're going to have a Ministry of African Integration and Foreign Affairs. What we call foreign is Western countries. And they met with World Bank and IMF and said, we put a pause on all the deal you had with the gas, with the, 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 the monetary agreement. We want to pause everything and review it. They paused the gas and the oil operation. They said they want to review every contract. So, so far, we've not seen them moving on any part of being sellout, but we are watching. And we are watching as Pan Africanists. Wow. Well, I, 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 brother, I guess at this particular point, it's a good point to interject the petition that you're working on. Yes. Yeah. So you want to speak on that. Yeah. Yeah. I. I. So put by my screen. On that. So I. Uh. Okay. Great opportunity. No. Up. Oh, I think I don't know the petition. I don't know whether it's on this slide, or is remo I removed it. All right. But I can say it often. You can take it down. So I. I. Yeah. That's not the. You can take the slide down. I will, yeah, I, I will say it without looking at it because I have it written down already. So I told the Pan-African community that this is our government. And when we fight to elect a government, we shouldn't sit down and watch that government being lobbied because there's something in governance called lobbying, which is a kind of a, a legalized corruption where people go and then pay money to these leaders and say, we want you to twist your policies this way and that way. So we, the Pan-African, shouldn't say, oh, we've elected a Pan-African government. Now we watch and see what they will do. No, we should petition them. We should wake up and go to them and say, this is what we want you to do. Because the Pan-African ideology, they didn't create it. It was something you and I, we all met and we fought to continue to keep it alive on the social media in writing we kept it alive and people have bought into this idea and that idea have produced a fruit which is a pan-african government so we need to petition it so i said 
I have three petitions. I mean, three ideas that I will put in my petition, and I want this idea to be developed by all African, Pan-African organizations. We can add more and be able to present it to the Senegal government. One, the first petition is, I want the Senegalese new government to pass a law to make Dakar, Senegal capital, a sanctuary for Pan-African activists. So that a Pan-Africanist who is under threat in America, in Brazil, anywhere in the world, he's under threat because of his view to protect black people. If he run to Senegal because of his Pan-African view, he should never be in prison or be extradited anywhere. That should be a safe haven for Pan-Africanism. That's one. After that is done, the second petition I want is to create a Pan-African research center, a Pan-African Renaissance a research center. The purpose of this research center should be able to bring African thinkers and intellectuals around the world who subscribe to Pan-African ideas because there's one mistake we always make. We think all black people are Pan-Africanists. No, all black people are not Pan-Africanists. Just because you are black doesn't mean you are Pan-Africanists. Pan-Africanism is an ideology. You have to buy into it before you be a Pan-Africanist. It's just like the Western world. They have their Western ideology. It's not all white people. They fight Russia. Russia is white, but because Russia does not buy into their Western Ideology, NATO ideology, they kick all other white countries that don't buy into it. So I'm going in, to in. interrupt at this point because we're having a, a an issue with our signal, and this is not uncommon to happen on the internet. Uh, we have voice uh, o over internet protocols sometimes, and and the uh, signal becomes garbled. But I also wanted to remind the listeners that you are listening to 360 Info Network right here on AM 1490 WERE. Our guest is Sekou Kella. He is a Pan-African activist. He's also a citizen of Liberia, currently living in Canada. But as you can see, he is very well tuned into what's going on on the continent of Africa in terms of politics and the economy. And we are talking about the uh, recent uh, election that took place in Senegal that saw the uh, government replaced by some young folks who have a better idea of what needs to happen with the resources of that country and the people of that country. And as we talk about on 360 Info all the time, it is so important for young people to take the destiny of the continent of Africa into their hands as groups like the World Economic Forum and others uh, deliberate on how they can reduce population, uh, particularly African population. And we're also mindful of the fact that Europeans are not being born at the rate at which they are dying. So it's another critical issue. We have a few moments before we will break away to our exclusive YouTube and Facebook broadcast. So you'll be able to see a continuation of our conversation with this great brother who is tuned into what's going on on the continent of Africa. My brother, I, I hated to interrupt, but people could not understand what you were saying because of the difficulty that we were having with the signal. Please resume. Okay. Thank you very much. So that was saying, I have I I have a proposal, and the proposal is to write a petition to the Senegalese government, and that proposal should be supported by Pan African organization. I need just five Pan African organization to come together to improve this proposal and make it and put it together as a petition, so we can write to the African in Integration Ministry in Senegal and to be able to meet the president. In that petition, one is that we are asking for a sanctuary law, a sanctuary bill to be passed to protect Pan-African activists in Senegal. When they come there, they should always be protected. Two, we need a Pan-African research center that will bring together African thinkers, Pan-African thinkers, to, to be able to come and share their ideas, innovation, discoveries, research, to be able to share it to the Pan-African world. So, so that together we know the progress we are making so that we can be able to trace what are the new ideas and what are the new things on ground that we need to focus on or what are the introspection that we need to do. 
The third one is to build an African education and research center, an African education trust. The African education trust is to try to decolonize education on the continent. The books that have been read in the universities and colleges are outdated and they are colonial and they need to go. In Nigeria, I, I did some of my high school in Nigeria. One of the books that we read is that there is a, a, a there's a man called I don't know I've forgotten his name who discovered the River Niger. Okay, they said a European Mango Park is his name, Portuguese sailor. That we are taught in the Nigerian school that a Portuguese Mango Park it discover the River Niger. And get how the discovery happened. He came and met a group of African fishermen. The, the, the Ijao people, and he said he wanted to trace the river, and they put him in their boat mm -hmm. and show him how the river went all the way to Mali. He came back, and he's the discoverer. And you are teaching your kid that Mongo Park came in this go. So the guys who put him in the boat, they were ghosts. So mm -hmm. those people he met there that were fishermen that lived there for generations, that knew how to navigate the river and put him in the boat and took him around, they don't exist. So there's something wrong with our education. Mm, okay. So uh, we're going to we're gonna, uh, continue with this explanation, but we're going to have to break away uh, as our engineer has informed us that we have about a minute left. So uh, right. I want to encourage everyone to continue uh, viewing this conversation on Facebook and YouTube. You can actually go to 360 Info Network on Facebook. You can go to my YouTube channel, which is Vince Robinson. You can also go to Hamptonio's YouTube channel, which is The Journey with Hamptonio, and you'll be able to continue to uh, listen to this great brother telling us what's happening. You know, this this is the uh, Barragani moment right now, and we're, we're learning what's going on on the continent of Africa as our young people rest control of their resources and rest control of their country away from the uh, colonialist powers that have dominated their history for the past couple hundred years. Uh, this is 360 Info Network. We would like to uh, thank our engineer, uh, Heaven Roberts Dixon, for making this broadcast possible. And we'd also like to thank you for listening. So as always, know yourself, love yourself, be yourself, make today your absolute best day, Cleveland and the rest of the planet. And we'll continue our conversation on Facebook and YouTube. Peace. Peace, everyone. Peace, peace. So uh, thank you for joining us on Facebook and YouTube. We would not be doing what we're supposed to be doing if we didn't ask you to like, comment, and subscribe. As you like, comment, and subscribe, it has a beneficial impact on the algorithms. You get notifications about when we go live. And the other beauty of doing things the way we are doing them now is that you can view the broadcast after it happens. So if you were in between here and there and you weren't able to tune in on your radio, you can go to our YouTube channel, you can go to our Facebook page and you can see these broadcasts after they happen. So Brother Sekou, you were talking about a petition that you were suggesting to the government of Senegal. Hopefully they will take you up on it and establish this research center for Pan-Africanism and uh, continue to explore the benefit of the resources that happen in those countries. Uh, what else can you tell us about what's going on in the three other countries that you identified? Uh, obviously, uh, the, the change in government has impacted those countries in terms of resting control of the resources that the colonialists wanted to continue to dominate. What impact has the government change had on those countries as you can see it at this point? Um, you're speaking of Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. Yes. Yes, so Niger, <clears throat> we've um, the, the, definitely the press is giving, you know, the Western media, once you go against their norm, then they have to keep giving you a bad press. So they they give only bad news, but two, two three significant things have happened. In Mali, you know, uh, the northern part of Mali was taken by the Islamist rebels the Azawad movement, the, who were actually a group of Libyans uh, and then some type of uh, 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 
<coughs> North African tribe called the Barbers. They, <coughs> excuse me. So they took over the entire northern part of Mali, and especially a city called Gao. But under the pan on this pan African government movement, they've recruited a lot of young people into the army. They've taken over. They've recovered all of this country from the rebels, and these territories, the French were there, the, the Germans were there, all these Western powers were there with all their military equipment. They couldn't recover these territories. They were even negotiating with these Islamists. But since they left, their prediction was that this country will fall to the Islamists within a few days. But the reverse has happened. These military guys were able to recover every inch of their territory from the Islamists. So that's very, very remarkable. Very, very remarkable. Absolutely. So that means determination is everything. Mm -hmm. We don't really need people to, to, to spoon feed us. When we determine, we can actually get anything accomplished. Mm -hmm. They liberated their country without this power. Yes, they had they bought some equipment from Russia, but their military did the job. They didn't have any European forces or American forces on the ground. The second thing that have happened is that they've been able to renegotiate deals on their natural resources which has actually boosted their economy. In, in Niger, they changed the price of the uranium. I mean, these people were one of the higher producers of uranium in the world, and it was almost bought, it was almost taken almost free by France, paid half a dollar or so. But today, these guys are selling about 200 and something dollars mm -hmm. for a piece of a, a gram or a kilo, I don't know. But they've actually almost about 100% increase to the price. And that has helped the local economy. And they are trying to build infrastructure. They are trying to be independent and do a lot of things for themselves, which in Burkina Faso, for example, the Itraure have created an industry to process gold for the first time. This is places where you just dig the gold, get the raw gold out, and straight is on the flight. As if our own resources don't like our country. As soon as you dig it out, it's a goal, yeah. The, 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 the Israelis are waiting. The Spanish are waiting. The Greeks are... It will be straight to the airport and it's leaving the country. The citizen will only see it on TV. <laughs> they, they pick the so, so carrot of diamond in your country and you mm. only see it on TV and it's gone. Mm. So what that already has done is said, all resources picked up in this country remain right here. We need a processing plant to process it add value to it before we take it to the market. Mm -hmm. So they say, oh no, the World Bank and other people came and said, no, you you know, it's going to create problems. You need to, if you do that, it's going to affect the economic system. All you need to do is to create a, 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 a kind of devalue your currency and then uh, kind of like pay less wages and then create more labor. They create all type of weird theories for these people and say, then sell the natural resources and you get a lot of revenue. They say, no. We need the industries here to process these things. So they've made those strategic moves, which is very, very good in our interest. Another strategic move they've made is that they came together and said, the army yes. fight together. Mm -hmm. They said, no longer Mali fighting terrorists mm -hmm. or Burkina Faso fighting terrorists. It has to be a joint movement. If we have a common problem and we are brothers, why don't we join forces together Here's America all the way on the other side of the Atlantic, but then they're forming NATO to defend European country on the other side of the sea. But here we are sharing the same border, common language, we eat the same food, and then we can join our armies to fight one enemy? What has stopped us all these years? It was like they woke up from their sleep. So they joined their armies together, and they have a joint... Uh, agreement that if you attack any of them, the three of them will show up. If you attack Burkina Faso tonight, you'll be fighting three countries. If you attack Mali, and that has saved them, because nobody want to go into war with those three, because they have a very huge territory. As if, you know, the media don't tell you that these countries, Niger is very, very big. Okay, we add Mali to that, you add another country to that, it's nothing compared to all these wars they are fighting. So if you will fight these three countries, you can have all the weapons. 
but they will go into guerrilla warfare in those desert and those caves. It will take you 50 years of war. <laughs> so nobody want to try that. So they send the French out, and Niger just send the Americans out as well. That they right. got to leave. So these brothers are making a lot of strategic moves. And and that's and that's my point. And you know that I kind of want to go back. And and the reason I kind of brought you on the show is 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 is, is to talk about this con con uh, this consciousness and and the probability and the likelihood of it spreading you know throughout the continent and and that's 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 what i think is is, is very important because if you if you you know looking at the future you know you got to look down the road and around the corner and you know we in america you get to this stage you know you you have to look towards the future you're looking for your kids and things of that nature and i think that's always put us in a in a back seat you know because we don't have that vision we had that, that loss of vision and not seeing the trends of what's going on. If you're an investor, if you're coming from an economic investment point of view, you try to see, you, 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 you narrow it down to trends and what's going on and what's, you know, so and futuristic possibilities. This is what you do as an investor. So if you're investing in pan Africanism, and which, which turns right into uh, economics as well, you have to look and see what's going on and see the trends. Now these country, three countries coming together, uniting the army, they they they're aligning themselves up with other so-called superpowers around the planet. Okay, they're telling America, "You're not going to boss me around and do those things." And and so this got to tell you and show you something that is taking place. You know, we we're not going to talk about the, the the free trade agreement. We you talk about the border situation is going on. They they're working on the visa uh, portion of it as well several countries like you said are starting to, to want to produce their own stuff for the for their own country and and bases like and vince brought up about the dot the gold standard uh situation for the dollars if you if you if you're not under a rock <laughs> you, you should be paying attention to something is happening here and this is this is the call that i'm just trying to say for my people over here in africa maybe not everybody but just to be paying attention to what's going on with this country because the internet i think uh yeah, what, yeah we created it anyway the internet but it has brought forth uh this making the planet smaller and i think it was it was very helpful in in waking up a lot of our, our young brothers and sisters over there and 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 i guess it didn't help with trump calling it uh you know butthole uh countries as well and it, it kind of offended some people as well so that's what i want to you know kind of focus on a little bit too about the consciousness of the young folks, you know, and to, to, to try to give our, our listeners and our people who may be thinking about going back and paying Africanism, the, 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 the insight on what the trend may be, may be going far as the consciousness of the folks and the young folks. Yes. There's been a great shift in the, in the consciousness of this generation. Even I myself, I can attest to that. And I'm, I myself is a testimony to that. You know that there's a great shift on the continent. The young people, we've traveled around and we've seen other countries. We've seen how we've been treated. We've seen people who like us how they have been treated, and we sat in the same class with Europeans and white people. We we get better grades. We we we, we beat them in math. We beat them in 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 in, in all other subjects, in psychology, in science, in chemistry. And so when we come back. And we find out that their country doing better than our country are not. Then we say, it is not that we do not have the same intellectual capacity, but it is because there is an underlying politics and an agreement that has that is not working in our favor. So that's what we need to change. That's what young people are saying. We need you to, to demystify government. We want to see everything now. We want to know what agreement being signed, what the hell is going on. And social media has done a lot of great job in pushing that agenda. People want to know everything now. And in fact, one of the things I even said I will include in my petition, but I I, 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 I kind of like put it in a way that the, this government will understand is that when you are building economy like that or sovereignty, what you do, you go around the world and start looking for black millionaires and billionaires. Give them a different uh, 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 option or, or incentives to encourage them to come. 
and the vet. Don't go around looking for war bank. They will come because where there is honey, the bee will naturally come. They, they, I mean, when they, you, you have uh, 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 animals, the lions will come around. You just make the environment conducive and everything will go well. But target your brothers first. Look for the billionaires in the African-American community and one of you and say, hey, I'm making different deal with you different from white corporations. If you are an African-American millionaire, this is a safe havens for you to come and invest. This is what we do. So, an agreement that he will never have in Europe, he can never have in America. Give him that advantage. Because don't follow these rules. Because white Europeans follow the rule when it's in their favor. Once it's not in their favor, they don't want to play the rules anymore. They did that when the global warming stopped. Before the, before the war, before the, uh, the Nord Stream pipe was broken in, 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 uh, in Russia and in Ukraine war. They said clean energy, clean energy, no more carbon. We have to do this. They were going around terrorizing everybody about global warming. But as soon as the North Pipe was broken and they have energy crisis, they all went back to coal. They broke the rule. The Paris Agreement didn't work anymore. In African countries that were following the rule, they were like, oh, what's up? Why are you guys not following the rule? They're like, no, no, no. We follow the rule when it is in our favor. But when the European life is threatened, no rules works anymore. But we are the only people who think we have to follow some type of economic rule or global rule. Let me tell you what happened in Italy after World War II. Uh, 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 yeah, after World War II down, they had a prime minister called uh, Silvio Berlusconi. Silvio Berlusconi wanted to build the economy of Italy. And he found out that Italy doesn't have any colony. There's nowhere to exploit like France. And he wanted money. So he told all the Italian mafias around the world. He said, I don't care how you make the money, but just give 10%. So Italy and your money is protected. Every millionaire Italian, I don't care how you got the money in America. I don't care how you got the money in Europe. Just come back to Italy and gave the government 10 percent. We are going to protect you. We are not going to extradite you anywhere. And every Italian mafia boss started moving their cash into Italy and they were protected and the economy went boom. You play by the rule with these people as if you live in a paradise. No, we don't live in a paradise. The world is a jungle. And you don't want to play with rules with these people. You got to find the rules that works for you. I'm looking at an African government in the Sahel and in Senegal. Go after, there are a lot of black people in the world that are millionaires. There are a lot of rich people in the African-American communities that are investing in, a, in an economy that doesn't work for them. Provide a safe havens for them and tell them, look, invest in real we gave you the energy sector electricity the water the agriculture power commerce come we gave you the first priority all the multinational companies of european have to wait you black billionaires we gave you the priority first come produce the clothes we wear in 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 in, in, in senegal and entire west africa what riches, that's why when we are telling our Pan-Africanism to our brothers, we are not saying that put your American passport in the toilet. That's why I keep telling people, we are telling you, let's build a solidarity economy. Like a brother Kanye West, when you made a one anti-Semitic comment, you went for a billionaire to zero. Imagine if you were in charge of your clothes, all the clothes we wear in West Africa were produced by Kanye West company based in Senegal. You can make the, all the anti-Semitic comments you want. Your economy remains. That's what we are talking about. That's real power. Okay? Yeah. But when yes. they can take it away from you anytime they want, you don't have sovereignty. So that's what we want, that type of economy. Our billionaire, they should stay wherever they want. The world is up for us. I'm so, I'm, solidarity economy. I'm glad you brought that up, Brother Sekou, because what we're seeing right now is a movement towards globalism and this one world government. But that's antithetical to the idea of sovereignty. You know, historically, you'll see that the United States would invite African leaders to America. There was no agenda. There was no plan. There was nothing that came out of it. And the African leaders were just supposed to feel special because they got an invitation from the United States to come to America and sit in a room with the president or some dignitary. But what happened in those exchanges is that when they went back to Africa, 
they gave up something and they didn't get anything in return. So they continued to be exploited. You know, I'm just wondering how as African countries, they can go against this idea of one world government in which they give up their sovereignty to someone that wants to manipulate them. The, the elephant in the room is that while we have this conversation, there are also conversations about some type of an event that mirrors what happened in 2020 when they shut the world down and then everybody becomes beholden to the interests of the WHO and you know all these other organizations that have been basically manipulating things in their favor. And I'm just hopeful that at some point we will be able to stand up and say, we want to be responsible for our own destinies. We want to have control of our own resources. We want to see development within our own countries and push back on the notion that you expressed earlier in our broadcast about this third world status. Right. Yes, this world government thing is something they call it a globalization. And I say in a global village, there is the village head, there's the village chief. Who is the village chief of this global village? The European wants to live in a global village as long as he is the head of the village. That's the problem. If you say you want a global village, we said, okay, can we, the African, be the head of the global village? They will say, no, 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 tomorrow morning there will be no global village. They want a global village, but then they are the head of the village. So it is not a village at all. It is a, it's, a, it's a plantation they want to create and be the head of that plantation. So we have to resist globalization because we are the Southern Hemisphere. We, from, we, we have a different history and experience. We, they have a different history and experience. There's a power dynamic that play into that. This... Uh, economy they, they benefited from to build their countries was at the detriment of our people, our suffering, our land that was stolen, our people that were stolen, our kingdoms that were destroyed, that were not naturally evolved into republics, our institution. That's why Chancellor William built, he wrote the destruction of black civilization. Our civilization was destroyed for their civilization to be built. So for you to ask us to have a global village based on that, we have to redefine. We have not even recovered from the evil that have been meted on us. And mm -hmm. you are asking us for oh, you and oh, we should play fair on the same game. No, I'm saying we need to go back and re-strategize, put our priority together. We are not playing with any rule that these people created. Every rule they created, they have to benefit from a 90%. That's the only time they'll be part of it. The UN is a scam, WHO is a scam, and IMF are all scams. Mm -hmm. That's the fact. Mm -hmm. Hey, brother, they got all these Africans working in those organizations, mm -hmm. but whenever those Africans work there, they they don't speak like Africans anymore. Right. When Fatou Ben Souda was the uh, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, she sent a letter says she want to talk to George Bush about the Iraq war. You know what happened in 24 hours? They gave sanction. They banned her never to enter in America. They put sanction on everybody in that court. But guess what happened? When Russia started the Ukraine war, they, they, the same America was back in the ICC to go arrest Vladimir Putin. They were after South Africa. That if Putin comes there, you got to arrest him. We are playing with people who play double games, double standard. They just bomb an embassy. In Syria, Israel just bombed an embassy in Syria. And under international law, the agreement in the UN Charter is that you do not bomb our diplomatic space. It's not allowed. It's a war crime. If you bomb an embassy, it's categorized war crime. I bet you to check any Western media right now that's calling what Israel did as a war crime. These are people who don't play to the rule, brothers. We need to be clear about that. <laughs> see, that's see, that's see, that's what I, that leads me to my question on yes. what I was going to say about you know uh, about African Americans and Africans as well. I mean, they're playing the same game over, brother. You know, and and the schools and history is so important. You know, see, a lot of our listeners need to understand. 
that if you colonize, and it happened to us because it's, it's so many things that are just coming up right now about our history over here in America that we never knew. You know, the creators say all shall be re revealed in the end. We still just finding out things. So you have to understand that over in Africa, if these folks in, in, with the Berlin Conference cut up everything and you're dealing with colonization that is going on and they're responsible for the infrastructure and building up the schools and things, what kind of history you think is being told? So a lot of our African brothers and sisters don't know their history, don't know this thing. And so the, the, those are some of the wheels that are turning and that, that is changing. And that's what we need to maybe fuel because we got our good brother, Dr. Whitaker and, and, and sister uh, Arikana and all of them is talking about the, the school of thought, changing the school of thought to, to, the, to, the, to a point to where, you know, we start educating our brothers and sisters. And we need to know that they're playing us both against each other. You know, and that's that's a, a, a important piece that has to be uh, uh, disseminated throughout the, the, the continent of, of understanding, and along with us as well. We have to get to that point, and the only way we're going to get to that point is, is dealing with history and understanding that the same game that's been played on, and understanding that we got a we got all got a common threat, and that's we is what we're going to need to unite ourselves to bring us out of it. And they need to know the importance of of owning and restoring back their own African traditions and, and, and leaving and going away, uh, getting away from those colonial ideologies. Because you still got people that's in the court in Africa that still wearing the white wigs when they go to court and all, under the colonial uh, 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 practices. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think that is very important. Yes. I, I remember when it comes to playing with playing to the rules and the double standard of the West, I always remember my childhood story when we were growing up in the village with our sisters. So we would try to play uh, soccer. And when you, you guys call it soccer, we call it football. So we would try to play football. So this our, our elder sisters, they would say, here are the rules. You don't use your hand. You can't touch the ball with your hand. You have to use your feet. But when we outrun them, with the younger folks and the young boys, they said, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. Once you want to score, they said, stop, 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 stop. We have to change the rules. I think we can use the hands now. <laughs> then they use the hand. When they score, then it's, it's okay. But by the time we get the ball and we want to score, they said, wait, 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 they changed the rule. It was just my childhood memory, and I remember that. This is what these guys are doing. Whenever they see that you want to do something that will benefit you, they change the rule. And the globe, the so-called international law, international rule, where everything trap they put in the way to keep them in power. Once you go against that rule, they say, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't have nuclear weapon, but we can have it. Or you can't do this, but they can do it. Oh, uh, South Africa, you can take the land from the minority. But America, you took the land from the natives. You, you have who owned the land in America? And they will tell you everything that they are doing, they, they have done. They said, don't do it. So we have to understand this, that this is a game. And this planet, nobody's coming to save us. We have to just decide and say, you know what? Enough of this nonsense. We need to strategize. We need to work for the prosperity and the common good of our people. We need to decide the, the rule that we want to play to. When they create a rule, we have to scrutinize that rule. If it play in our favor, it don't play in our favor. We don't need to follow it. And if by not following, it doesn't mean you are breaking any rule. They just made the rule. That's what they do in America. They create all these rules. I find here in Canada, they, there's, there's a community that have this overdose problem. White community. The government made it an emergency. It became a respect for TV program. People decided there's no prison. Man. Even if they found them with the drugs, they tried to give them all the help they can. They try to provide every assistance, government funded. If a black community go into overdose, my goodness, it will become, they will be stigmatized and they will become criminal. Police will barricade that area. You have to know, it's the, it's the same thing, but they're just changing around. Okay? They do it to your kid in the school. What our other kid will do it will be taken as play. Your kid do it. There will be a report that your kid is violent. And you, you don't even follow up. You just get angry with your kid. No, they are dramatizing and trying to change the rule for your kid. You have to follow up all of these things. They try to put it in the head of your kid that they are violent. 
while the kid was just real play. But when that kid do it, it's okay. So you have to understand how this psychology works, how they is also implanted in their in their power dynamics, their politics, their economy, their, their our relationship. Everything is impacted by this double standard. And if you don't understand it, you are that's why African countries are stuck. They think there's an international law out there that they are following. Oh no, you can't do this in the market. The free market says this. Oh no, you can't increase the price. This is the price of God. You can't increase it. I produce the cocoa. I can decide and say, you know what? My cocoa is 200 tomorrow. But France, France will tell Ivory Coast, no, you can't do that. We have to see how many Italians are drinking coffee this month. Then we will decide how much you can sell it. So, and they are the entire population of Ivory Coast is waiting for France to tell them how much is cocoa next month. Why? <laughs> Why? We should decide. We produce our stuff. We own the cotton. We own the uranium. We have the gold and the oil. God damn it, we should decide the price. They shouldn't decide the price for us. The moment we allow them to decide the price, that's where we lost the sovereignty. Yes. You know, uh, brother, I, I got to bring this up because this is something that we deal with here in Cleveland a lot. And I'm sure Cleveland is not unique in this. Uh, but sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. You know, we, we, we're we kind of divided in a sense because you have Africans and then you have Africans in the diaspora. And you are the evidence of an African in the diaspora because you're outside of Liberia, which is your native country. But I, I guess what I'm wondering is, what we can do to create more unity within our world community. You know, Africans many times come to America, they're told not to have anything to do with us, speaking in terms of black Americans, if we can use that term. And so that they come to, to America, they isolate themselves. We don't really have the cohesion that we should have as Africans all within our respective countries uh, what kinds of things do you think can be done to kind of mend the disunity that that occurs within our people and uh, get us to a point where we can uh, lock arms and realize what and who the enemy is and do what we can to retain our rightful place in, in the world uh, structure? Yeah, I said something a few years back and some people think I was being radical and I was not. I said, we pan-Africanists that have have this consciousness, we were supposed to have our government without a country. We don't have to wait until that there is a country that, su that successfully agrees to pan-Africanism. If you count the number of people who adhere to pan-African ideology around the world today, I think we will be close to a million. If we are close to a million, that means we are a million strong. That means we are economic power right there. Why the Marcus Garvey and other people, Sylvester Williams and all these people, they had a Pan-African Congress. There was no country. They met in UK and other places. They had a Pan-African Congress. They elected a leader and there was a business. There was a movement. They were all in respective countries, but they had an entire Pan-African structure that was advocating Black solidarity, advocating for uh, issues that deal with Black people globally. They were also advocating how to enrich themselves and become powerful, making business and strategic and political moves in their respective countries. But they have this global togetherness. That's what Pan-African is supposed to do. But what we've done on the last few years is that we all relegated to our countries, and then we sat down waiting to see what's going to happen. And that was the big mistake. Yesterday, I was on a show, on Sarnetta's show, where a brother called Dr. Muhammad Ali, he was from the Nation of Islam, but these days he's claiming to be Aboriginal uh, American. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a show and then we went on, we are we are discussing, he, then there were a group of them there, they are like, we are not Africans. We, mm -hmm. are, we, are, we are black native uh, Americans. And then you Africans are forcing us to be African and one of you. So I, I went there yesterday and I gave my own view. I'm like, look, it's not an idea of someone wanting to force you to be African or we African coming here and someone need to force us for us to be closer to our brothers in America. The truth is that our history 
is what we need to look at. When we look at our history and we look at the facts of our history, then we have to build solidarity based on that history. The reason why many people don't want to be African, the reason why Africans who are not educated don't, or who are not informed don't want to associate with Black Americans is because they think that association brings no power or benefits. That's the truth. Me calling me African, what would that give me? I don't, I don't want to be associated with that. You want to be, you want to be black Chinese? Yeah, I want to be black Chinese. China is powerful, mm -hmm. so I'm black Chinese. Wow. You want to be um, the Jewish and then Hebrew? Yeah, because Israel is powerful, so I'm Hebrew. So there is a power, global power Absolutely. dynamics to that. Absolutely. The bro. reason people don't want to identify with the name Africa is because there is no, there is no power benefits mm -hmm. to it yep. and africans too who leave and go to america they are like black american uh are, are being dispossessed in america they are disproportionately targeted they drug they, dealers and they, everything they, else they, they are disproportionately targeted mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then uh, there is a systemic movement to make to make sure that their wealth they don't become as wealthy and powerful as the other competing mm -hmm. okay. so the african don't want to identify. Mm -hmm. He wants to be any other. He wants to be Muslim. He wants to be Arabic, Black, or anything. You can call anything Aboriginal, anything. If I have one percent Native American, I'm Native because at least I belong <laughs> to the people who own this land. Government will give me some incentives. I will have some benefit. This part of the name is what I've been playing. But you and me, we see beyond that. We look at history and see how powerful we were. That's what make our consciousness different. So all we need to do as the Pan-African world is to create a power, a powerful group, a powerful, a solidarity, powerful group. It doesn't matter whether we have a country. You can be American, I can be here in African and what have you, but we build a powerful Pan-African group that look after each other, education, that look after each other in terms of solidarity and what have you. Everybody want to be identified with our group. You see, Marcus Garvey group. Every black people wanted to be part mm -hmm. of the of 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 of, of, the, of of the black star mm -hmm. because it was powerful. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted to be nation of Islam. A lot of black Muslim converted to Islam at that time because Elijah Muhammad's movement was powerful. Identifying with it with the NOI, you be wearing tie suit, you look clean, you belong to a very respectable group. A human being is drawn to power. And as long as black people look weak in the world, the, the, the slow-minded among us don't want to identify with us. Mm -hmm. I, That's I the truth. That's, That's yeah. why you will find Africans when they get to uh, Nigerians and other people who are misinformed. Because Nigeria is one of the countries where Pan-Africans they kind of jump over them. They seem not to have zero Pan-African education. They come and they just blend into an American society. They don't acknowledge your struggle. They don't acknowledge that black Americans have to die for them to even have a visa to come and eat in a restaurant there. They don't know. They don't even acknowledge that. They don't know that black Americans have to die for them to go vote, for them to sit in that train, in that bus. They don't know that. How many of them even visit the African-American museums? They don't know. They're like, Nigerians are the most educated immigrant group in America and they, they're showing up, you overlook the struggle of your brothers and sisters who lay their down to sweat and in the, in the belly of the beast that laid the ground. Because there's no Pan-African education in Nigeria. So the black skin, and now that's what I say in the beginning, does not qualify the person to be a Pan-African. Mm -hmm. We must not make that mistake. It is an ideology that you must be educated into it. I was born in a Sunni Islam, trained to look towards Saudi Arabia as the land of promise, as the, as the land of God, to see Arabic as the language that on which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge us in the last day in Arabic. I will cry for Palestine than to cry for George Floyd. That's the way I was designed. I remember September 11th when it happened and George Bush sent the army into Iraq. I remember as a teenager, I was crying in front of the TV because there were Arab soldiers dying. And right there in Congo, there were people dying. Mm 
I don't even know about it, but I was crying because an Iraqi children were killed and I had trauma because that's how the black people have been trained. The black Christian are, are designed towards Israel. The black Muslim are designed towards Saudi Arabia. Nobody is designed towards Africa and African agenda. So that's why Pan-Africanism needs to take the lead. We need to form a global solidarity. We don't need to wait till we have a country. We need to have that global solidarity, annually elect our leaders, decide our economy, decide strategically in the world what we need to do. Zionism that created Israel did not have a land. It was an economic and political movement. Zionism was powerful until they were able to force the British to give them Palestine to be Israel today. It was an ideological movement. So Pan-Africanism need to go back to that same thing. Today, internet have made it easy for us. We can stand together, we can have a fund, we can decide that every year in the Pan-African community, we are going to produce 100 scientists. We're going to sponsor certain Pan-African children into STEM to study this particular area of science. So that in the next 100 years, if you are looking for astrophysicists, you will find Pan-African children to be on the top list. We can do, design those strategies for ourselves. So yeah. I'm saying it is the Pan-African duty to educate black people. Otherwise, every black person is want to gravitate to our other powers because there is no power in our middle. Yeah, I think that one of the important things that you pointed out was just the importance of identity. And, you know, we're confused when it comes to identity because we don't necessarily relate to nationhood. And the reason for that is because our minds have been erased of our connection to Africa. But this is one of those situations where science and history have a marriage. So we can look at our DNA and we can examine our DNA and determine what our roots are. We can relate to the families that we came from, from the continent of Africa, including those who claim to be indigenous to this land and you know black native american you know because the, the the truth of the matter is even they have a direct relationship to africa because we all came out of africa so you can't really separate yourself from the continent because even the europeans have african roots we, we look at the history Egypt and and i i gotta amplify this because a couple weeks ago one of our guests, uh, Professor Menu Ampim, uh, was in about, involved in a conversation with uh, Michael M. Hotep, who is an African scholar, African-centered scholar in Detroit. And he talked about the first people on the earth and these people were of smaller stature. So he talked about how, when you look at Ireland, for instance, the indigenous people to Ireland were actually Africans of smaller stature. That's where this whole idea of the leprechaun came from. And that that uh, that romantic notion that we have about St. Patrick and St. Patrick supposedly banished all the snakes from the island of Ireland. Well, actually what really happened was he was involved in the removal of Africans in Ireland from that island. So again, if we look at history, we look at our genetic makeup, there's no reason for us to be confused about who and what we are. There's no country in the world called Black Land. So we call ourselves Black, but we don't have a nation to connect ourselves to, which is a source of our power and our sovereignty. So we have to have that education that you talk about so that we can begin to inform ourselves about who and what we are. And when we figure out who and what we are, then we can realize what we should be doing. And what we need to do is unify for the benefit of the entire uh, African population around the globe, you know, and not just those that are in particular countries, because the debt that is owed to us is a global debt. The Europeans owe us for all of the exploitation that has occurred in the past four or 500 or maybe even longer than that. There's been an exploitation that has resulted in the, uh, the resting of the resources from the continent and the failure of those colonialists to enable development of those countries 
so that those people could be self-sufficient. That's the reason that the poverty exists because the resources are being removed without any direct benefit to those who are right there in direct proximity to them. That's what, well, that's what education, again, we're right back down to education. When you talked about that divide, the divide between us and, and, and the Africans, it's, it's all about education and mindset. And we got to have more platforms to tell our story and the science of it. You know, I, you know, it's funny to uh, say, cool, you use it, use it in my head. Cause I, I say that all the time about uh, uh, us and, and how they uh, put up these particular barriers by, by false information or just by the lack of knowledge. You could trust to this. If scientists was to come out and talk about some serious benefits by being African, something in the genome, something in the DNA, something that is supernatural about being African, yeah. these nigger roles would want to identify with being African. But because yeah. you don't have the education and the platforms to talk about those rich traditions, the laws of mind, and on how everything was that you're dealing with as far as Christianity is concerned that you got from Africa, because you know every time the Discovery Channel and all the rest of them come on talking about Egypt, they never get into the spiritual systems. If you understood the spiritual systems, you would be able to link up and see the theft, the stolen legacy that has been taken. So like you said, there's no benefit for aligning themselves up with Africa right now because mm -hmm. The science world, the, the economic and the spiritual world is not giving you the information that, that make you feel proud about lining yourself up with that. So right. Let's believe if they did, if we had platforms and the education to do that, then they'll want to associate themselves with Africa. Definitely. If, if the promised land of God is not in Africa, it's in the Middle East. And the last prophet of God, the creator of the universe, is from Saudi Arabia. And the people who brought civilization, the Greek miracle, quote unquote, quote unquote, Greek miracle, are from Europe. Why would I want to be African? <laughs> you know, this is what these, these people are telling you. The slow among us. Okay, they want to be everything else other than being an African. But until you restore that, I myself, to be proud to be an African was after I read the history. After I've looked at Councillor William, I've read Diop, I've read John Henry Clark. I'm like, what education did I receive all these years? I went to school in, in Africa. I went to, I was taught nothing. I was taught to glorify outsiders. Knowledge was seen as something that came. There was no connection between African spirituality and anything that has to do with theology, that has to do with, it was something that was seen as human evolved from primitive thinking into complex thinking. And African spirituality is part of the primitive thinking of early human that is trapped, that is not really evolved to be a religion. This is the why European anthropologists who came to Africa, that's how they portray it to be. That it was somehow supposed to evolve, but it never evolved into monotheism. It was worshiping of trees and worshiping of snakes and what have you. Now, when we look at them and said, okay, I told the Muslim, you said, I, I said, is that what you think our spiritual system has been? He said, yeah, our ancestors were worshiping rocks and what have you. So I think your ancestor was not intelligent. He just saw a rock in his backyard and he started worshiping the rock. That's what you really believe? He said, yeah. I said, okay, why do you pay millions of dollars every year to go to Saudi Arabia to kiss a rock? He said, no, 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 no. We don't worship that rock. It is a spiritual symbol. We worship the almighty. So I said, okay, why don't you think that rock in your village was also a spiritual symbol for your ancestor? You think the Arabs were more smart to kiss the rock, but when your ancestor do it, it's bad. It is this thinking that we need to change. It is the education that has not been received, that is not yet in the ministry, which is a Pan-African duty for us to really, really, the Pan-Africanism that many people understand is on the political level. They just see the political level of we having a political unity. That's fine. But there is a cultural dimension yes. <laughs> to it, which many people want to avoid. 
And that cultural dimension is what we need to teach. Otherwise, everybody wants to be everything else other than being an African. That's why I am saying, let us continue to be together. Let's build solid institutions that really propagate this idea. Because once the African is liberated in the mind, you don't need to do anything anymore because the person is liberated. They will continue to fight to protect and safeguard that liberation. That's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. In agreement. Well said. In agreement. That's it's, it's to that point. The question I want to ask both of you guys then is something that I was, uh, you know, writing about is that our talented 10, as, as has been quoted before. Now, what you just said is not rocket science. You know, you know, for our talent to ten, for the Cornell Wesses and things of the world, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know. Hey, yeah. I, I, well, I, I, I'm sorry for cutting you off. There's something I wanted to add, uh -huh. which I forgot. You see, um, when Alexander the Great came into Egypt, what did he call himself? He said he was born of Amun. He mm. he wanted to be an African. He found his portrait. He didn't portray himself as a European. He portrayed himself as the Egyptian that were on the wall. If you see many of the Ptolemy pharaohs, they try to portray themselves as black people. Yes. Why? Because there was power to be black. It meant power. All the Greeks in, in uh, teachers in Greek those days, you have to, even if you have never been to Egypt, you have to lie. They say, I was in Egypt. For you to be respected, you have to say, I was in Egypt. Then everybody says, oh, then, then he got knowledge. If he was in Egypt, so everybody in the Homer, the, one of the most important earlier uh, uh, intellectual yeah. work in Europe. Mm -hmm. He said the gods, Zeus, every year have to go to Ethiopia on a pilgrimage to purify himself. Mm. Now, Ethiopia has to be powerful in the mind of those people who think that their god has to go to purify itself in the land of the Ethiopian. Wow. Now, when you look at the classical document, you see the image of your people, how glorious and powerful it was. It was easy for them to change it in the Roman period, late, late Roman period, from one Roman to right, that the only thing good about the black man is that he have a very huge phallus. He has a very big manhood. That was the beginning for them stigmatizing us. Mm -hmm. So it's the image. It's the thing. That's why the African, like Diop, and other people, they're saying that it is the image of the black man that we must change because they have a caricature image of us, which is embedded in the mind. Even we, the black people, have accepted that image mm -hmm. to a point that we have accepted the image that they painted of us. The day we, our deified image returned on the throne, mm -hmm. everybody want to be black. Every, every, every white people that came into Egypt wanted to make their hair like our women. We see it. They all play the, they all want the drillers. It's on the pyramids. They all wanted to be everything. And they, even the shameless Europeans, Egyptologists, who deny the blackness of Egypt, but there's one thing they don't deny. They said the Egyptians have Nubian hair, Nubian hairstyle. Why would the Egyptian want to have a Nubian hairstyle? Okay, that was the power of the day. Mm. The Egyptians were African, but even the whites that came to live among them, the Asians needed to look like African because that was the most powerful image you can get. That's where we need to get. Mm -hmm. Once you put that image back, you don't need to fight anybody. Even the one with 1% European will say, I'm, I'm black. <laughs> they want to be black quickly. Okay. But right now, I see my brother Ali Mohammed, who mm. looks like a Senegalese. He's telling me that he's Native American. Mm. I said, brother, you can be Japanese as you want. I have no problem with you. As far as I'm concerned, is that if you buy into Pan African ideology, we can work together. Hey, let, let, let me say, you, you know what you just said, and it's something yeah. that I, I speak of, was writing about as well. It, it, it goes right back to what we was talking about. We, we, we're one percent. We're rather identify at this point, identify with anything. What you just said. Our, our Greek brothers and frat brothers. I, I know I'm hurting y'all a little bit, but come on, y'all. You around there getting branded in the name of Greek and all this, all them symbolisms and everything else is African. And they got it all from there, but, but you'd rather identify and call yourself being a Greek than being African. Come on, man. It's, yeah. it's, come on. 
please. So, no. so Brother Hamptonio, what, what was the question that you wanted to ask? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about it. Yeah. Uh, basically, just saying, what is it to the point that if you got our talented 10, like Cornell and all the rest of them, don't understand or will not, you know, uh, charge the, the whole to the whole fact of us teaching ourselves? And, and and our history in schools and things they, and like you just said before it ain't rocket scientists understanding that we've been miseducated like our good brother dr wilson said okay that's that's a and i, I i'm sure that was a common read during the time of of cornell west is coming up because when i understood his i looked at his background he, he was brilliant young coming up you know what i mean so i'm sure he read uh woodson and du bois and all of them and and, and understood the whole miseducation piece. How come they're not championing that cause for us to have our own schools and the whole and, and deal with our children on the economic, I mean, on the educational level? I can't get it. Well, it's um, I'll put it this way: one of the important works that I have read. I don't like. I'm not a fan of Greek literature, but there's something I read on Plato. Republic, which I love, is about a group of men who were put in a dungeon and they've never seen light or sun in their life. And they were made to face the wall and there's a huge fire lit in their back. So all they saw was shadows. Even those who brought food for them and set it down, they always see shadow. So for them, reality was shadow. And till one of them escaped out of the dungeon and he went out and saw reality, and saw the light, and saw everything, and he was amazed, and he was he was he was really 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 impressed. And he came back to the dungeon and told his friends. He said, "Friends, I have seen the reality. The shadows we've seen on the wall is not the reality. There's real reality out there. There's trees, there's water, and everything." And the men in the dungeon said, "We have to tie him up. He lost his mind. There's something wrong with him." And they tie him up and they oppress him. And to a point, the men who saw the realities started to think actually that probably he could have been mad. He started believing the popular narrative that probably he could have lost his mind, possible that what he saw outside the dungeon was fake. He started buying into the, the dungeon uh, shadow again. So what am I trying to say? What has happened over the years with so many black intellectuals like Cornel West, like um, one other one, uh, 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 what Louis is his Gates. name? Louis Gates. Uh, Gates, Henry's mm -hmm. Louis Gates, mm -hmm. and all of these people. The problem is they have seen the light. They know the truth. They have read some of these books. But when they go back into the Western academia cycle, where white supremacy still rules supreme, they are told that if you hold this narrative, you are a crazy Afrocentrist. You will be uh, isolated. Mm -hmm. You will not be accepted into the mainstream academia, places like uh, 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 Harvard University. You won't be able to give speeches because you will be seen as extremist. So to buy into this, to be able to be in the mainstream, you have to move into the neoliberal thinking. You have to sound like the, how the government wants you to sound. So that's how you get funding. That's how you will be able to be sponsored. So eventually, they start to change their view. And eventually, they find themselves, they know it, but then they find out that by standing on that view, it affects everything that makes them to be powerful as they are. So they have to buy into it. It's happening to a lot of black scholars. Even we, on some level, all of us. I remember when I started my NGO, I call it, I, I, I gave it a very Afrocentric name to be able, because my intention was how to get Afrocentric books into black people in prison in Africa. I was not focused here at all. The organization will be formed here, but my idea is to get African classical books and go target our brothers who have been incarcerated in prison and what have you, because all they read in those prisons is Bible and Quran. So, but if I can give them African, but when they come back, they become militant for Pan-African movement. So I gave it, and my woman looked at the title of my organization. 
She's like, yeah, I have a problem with your the name you gave. I said, why? She said, well, you need funding from Canadian institutions and you are being radically Afrocentric with this name. And then the name sound like you are excluding other people. Then I started receiving attack. Then one of my friends called me also. He said, you know, you, I love this organization, but you need to do something about it because how will you get funding? Everybody started coming after me. I'm like, okay. I will change it to I Care Canada. Will that work? They're like, okay, that sounds better. <laughs> so I changed the name to I Care Canada. But then I started doing some reflection. I'm like, how did I even get, how did I even change my organization name? That's how powerful. That's for me on a very small level. Tell me somebody on a higher level how they push them for them to dilute their stand. The society is pushing us to dilute our stand every day because it go against the norm. It go against the standard of what they want it to be. So you got to sound like them. You got to sound like other people. You see our brother Obama in power, how he was talking as if he forgot the struggle and the history of what has happened, the incarceration of black people. He was, he has to talk like George Bush. He has to talk like other people over there. So this is the system. So Cornell West and others, you don't have to count on these people. And one of the things also I want us to know in this struggle, it is not all black people who are going to buy into black struggle. In fact, there will be a substantial number of black people who will stop it from happening, who will stop black mm. liberation from happening. In the day of slavery, there were slaves who did not want slavery to end. Probably they were managers. They were middlemen between the slave master and those on the plantation. So they were cooking the food. They were having the best part of the meat. They are like, if this end, I lost my job. It has House to continue. Negroes. House Negroes. Yes. There were people today, gatekeepers, who don't want to let go. Okay? So we have to look at those people for who they are and look at those who have bought into the ideology itself and be able to consider them as part of our own. I'm not making that me coming from a Muslim background. I don't see all black people as Pan-Africanists. I know black people in Africa who are forming Boko Haram, an Islamic movement to Islamize Africa, to submit to Saudi Arabia. There are black people who are moving around, want black women to cover their faces. They're all black. In fact, there was a point, all this planet was black. So we have the good, the bad, and ugly among us. We have to take note of that and not be mistaken and see a brother like us. Oh, he's a brother. No, he might just sell you out. He might just sell you out that he sold the Black Panther movement. Every organization we formed was infiltrated by us through the enemy. It's not yeah. people from outside. We the bought people among us to destroy it. So we need to know that. Yeah, see, well, you've said it eloquently, and I'll restate it. All of your <laughs> your skin folk ain't kin folk. And yes. I, I'm reminded of J. Edgar Hoover, what, who was a black man, but he also realized that the greatest threat to what I call pseudo white supremacy mm -hmm. is pan African intellectual thought. And I guess we're going to have to end it there because you let us know that you need to step away at one o'clock, and we're pushing up on one o'clock. So uh, Brother yeah. Sekou, this has been absolutely amazing. You have shared so much uh, information with us today that uh, we have a better view of what's going on on the continent. Uh, you you kind of opened up another can of worms in, in the, the last few comments that, that you made, and perhaps we'll have another conversation about that as we continue our dialogue. But I want to thank you for joining us on 360 Info Network today. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here, brother Antonio. Thank you always for, you know, keeping in touch. And brother Vincent, I'm really, really grateful. I would just like to close with uh, the, my parting comment will be on the main idea of Pan-Africanism is to be, be us to be allies. And when you turn to the subject of allies, I love how the word allies is rendered in my language. So in Madingo, the word for ally is badenya, badenya. And badenya means, literally it means, children of my mother. Those are your allies. 
-hmm. Why children of your mother? Because in the, the African polygamy is something that is allowed in our society. So when a man can have two wives, but then every mother bring up her kid. So my mother's children and I, we live in the same house. We eat the same food. We are likely taught by the same teacher who is our mother. We grew up with the same ideology and philosophy. We have the same understanding. So my mother's children are my natural allies because we've sucked the same breast. We've eaten the same food. We have the same thinking. Now, your adversary or your opponent in our in the Madingo language is Fadinya, my father's children. Now, it doesn't mean your father's children are your enemy, but the concept of adversary is my father's children. Why? My father can have two wives. And we all have the same DNA, but we are brought up in the two houses of two different women. We may not eat the same food every day. We might not have the same teacher, which are our mothers. We might not have the same orientation and understanding of what is bad and good. So while we may have the same DNA, we have two different orientations. So your father, children in the Madingo psyche is the symbol of your adversary. Your mother's children or my mother's child is the symbol of your allies. And for somebody to be your ally, it's not necessarily because you have the same DNA. It is necessarily because you eat the same food, you have the same orientation, you have the same teaching. Mm -hmm. Like your mother brought all of you up with her idea and her philosophy. So you have common values. That's what makes you allies. Mm -hmm. So in Black America, don't make a mistake that every African-American brother is an ally. <laughs> is he your mother's child? Is he your badia? Badia. Do you, yeah, is he your badin, badia? Do you guys have the same values? It is what makes you allies. Because if I'm going to war, I need people, the soldiers behind my back, to be my allies. Otherwise, they're going to shoot me. Okay? So just because DNA, we will, make a, we will continue to struggle. We never get there because we think we look alike, so therefore we are allies. No, there is Badenya and Fadenya. That is how the Mandinga Empire used to see adversary and uh, an opponent. Do we have the same values? If we don't, then I treat you with suspicion first. Uh -huh. If we have the same value, then I'm naturally inclined to think you understand the code. Mm -hmm. So with that, I said thank you once again for inviting me on 360. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. And as always, know yourself, love yourself, be yourself. Make today your absolute best day. Peace, everyone. Peace and blessings, my brother. Thank you. Yes.